So it's a pleasure uh, to have uh, Zohar Koma Gorsky here. So he's going to give four lessons, one today, two tomorrow, one on Friday. And he's going to give you exercises like the others. So hopefully you know, there'll be interaction during the exercise session so you won't just be listening, you'll also be interacting. Well, uh, thanks so much. Uh, also more, there is a huge echo. Is that normal here? That's how yeah, it's... We're trying to fix it. Okay, so other than the interactions in the exercise session, I would be more than happy if uh, we have as many as possible interjections during the talk with questions and uh, discussions. It would make everything more, it would make these uh, sessions, I think, more uh, pleasant for everybody if there were some interactions during the session. So please ask as many questions as you like. Um, and I am, while I have prepared a lot of material, I'm not determined to cover everything, so we can also go slower and uh, discuss various topics that come up. Okay, so let me start. I'll start by uh, just setting up some terminology. Uh, this, this terminology is something that I'm gonna use uh, throughout uh, this course, so I wanna explain this terminology. Uh, maybe some of this terminology is familiar to you, but some may not. So I want to just spend 15 minutes in the beginning uh, setting up this terminology straight. So we will be discussing uh, the subject of quantum field theory. Uh, and I'll often use uh, the terminology that the quantum field theory model is gapped or it may be gapless. I'll often use this kind of terminology which is widespread nowadays. So I first want to define precisely what I mean by gapped versus gapless. So in quantum field theory, uh, so in quantum field theory we have some Hamiltonian. That's one way of thinking about it. Uh, we can put the theory in infinite space, Rd minus one times time. And we have a Hamiltonian. So the meaning of a gapped model is that the Hamiltonian may have the ground state wave function, which is an eigenstate, and that the energy of the ground state wave function could be taken as a convention to be zero. However, there is a question of where do the next uh, excitations appear? If the energy gap to the next excitations is uh, strictly bigger than zero, then we say that this model is gapped. And in fact, any typical quantum field theory would be gapped. It takes a miracle for there to be excitations which do not have any energy gap. So a typical quantum field theory, unless you fine tune it, or uh, if it's a somewhat more special model, would be gapped. That's the typical situation. So this is what we call the gap. But when the energy gap vanishes, so there are excitations above the ground state of the theory which have uh, essentially the same energy at the infinite distance, at infinite volume, then in this case, we, this case we say that the model is gapless. A slightly more precise, a slightly more precise uh, characterization of that case could be to put the theory in, in some big box. We could, we could put the theory in a big bo box of size L, and then the energy gap to the uh, excitations would not strictly vanish, but it would go like some power law with some power here. So in a box, the spectrum is typically gapped and there, the gap goes like one over the volume or one, some lens parameter to some power, okay? So that's characteristic of a gapless model and that's characteristic of a gapped model. In a gapped model, the energy difference to the next state does not go to zero as you take the size of the box to infinity. So this explains the terminology of gapped versus gapless. I'll be using this terminology a lot. Another piece of terminology that I'll be using is the notion of phase transitions. So a theory could have a parameter P. So let P, or lambda, so let lambda be some parameter in the Hamiltonian. 
So as a function of this parameter, there could be various scenarios. It could be that for some values of this parameter, the theory is gap. For some other values, it's gapless. And there could be various transitions that happen as we change this parameter. So we can discuss, let's say, one typical situation where this parameter is like a real number. And we could, uh, one typical situation is that for, let's say, uh, lambda that is smaller than some, tip, than some critical value, lambda critical, we have a gapped Hamiltonian. For lambda that's bigger than the critical value here, we have maybe some other gapped Hamiltonian. And at that particular point, we have a gapless theory. So that's one uh, possible scenario. So there could be a gapless model here. When you have a gapless model in unitary uh, relativistic quantum field theories, it's uh, assumed, and in some cases proven, that there is a conformal symmetry. So at gapless points, uh, gapless points could arise, there are two knowns, there are two known mechanisms for gapless points to arise. One mechanism is uh, a conformal field theory. And the other mechanism is spontaneous symmetry breaking. These are two general scenarios. These are two general mechanisms which could give rise to gapless points. Some generic conformal field theory or some spontaneous symmetry breaking. A la number Goldstone, the number Goldstone uh, bosons. So this gapless point could be due to symmetry breaking or it could be due to some phase transition. When there is a gapless point like that, we say that the transition is the second order. It could also be that uh, for lambda smaller than lambda critical, it's a gap theory. For lambda bigger than lambda theory, than lambda critical, it's also a gap theory. But the transition does not involve a gapless mode. So it could be that the potential of the theory, so to speak, looks like that, and then it looks like that, and then it looks like that. Sorry. So this case, this is another possible scenario in which you have two gapped vacua. And it so happens that the true vacuum here is this one, and the true vacuum here is this one, and they may not be the same. So they may have completely different properties. But the transition does not involve the, a gapless mode. This is called the first order transition. While when the transition involves a gapless mode, this is called the second order transition. So this is called the first order. So in pictures, a first order transition looks like that, and a second order transition looks like that. Okay? So this is second order. So, so when you have two gapped vacua, which are different, the transition between them could be through the merging of these two points, which leads to a massless particle here, or it could be through just the fact that the energy of these two gapped states changes. Okay, so this is another piece of, another thing that we will encounter is a, the existence well, another thing that, you, that we encounter generically in first order transitions and also in discrete symmetry breaking is this, is this situation. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. How does that fit into this terminology? It is slightly, strictly speaking, outside of the rules that I uh, explained just a second ago. So I want to elaborate a little bit about how that fits into the terminology. So let's discuss the situation that we have a continuum quantum field theory with two vacua that are exactly degenerate. So we now see that this can happen in two situations. One is when there is a discrete symmetry that is spontaneously broken. So this could happen in discrete symmetry breaking. And this could also happen in first order transitions. Okay? First order transitions do not have to be associated with discrete symmetry breaking. They could be just a generic phenomenon that happens at some co-dimension of the parameter space. So for example, in water, there is a famous uh, water or liquid, liquid uh, vapor degeneracy that happens at the melting point. And there is no symmetry between li liquid and vapor 
in uh, water, these are completely different gap states. Uh, but since there is a first order transition, they're exactly degenerate. So this situation could arise either from symmetry breaking or just from the existence of some first order phase transition between two gap phases of quantum field theory. Okay, so let me just spell out the rules for that. So strictly speaking, if you computed the energy, uh, if, you com if you try to qu quantize or so diagonalize the Hamiltonian in a box, what you would find in this case is the following fact. So if you put the theory in a box of size L, uh, then the energy difference between the ground state and the next state would go like an exponential of minus some number times the size of the box. to some power. So it's exponentially small. So you might think that this therefore fits into this picture. It's more like this picture than this picture. So for this reason, this terminology is not complete. So the rules here are not complete. The rules here apply when there is one ground state. So when we have one ground state and we want to discuss the question of whether it's gapped or gapless, this is a correct set of rules. But when we have two ground states, we have to discuss the question of whether they are gapped or gapless for each one separately. Because when you have two such ground states, the, strictly speaking, if you, da, if, you were to, if you were to compute the Hamiltonian in finite volume, you would find that these two states differ by an exponentially small term. And this is, of course, familiar because of tunneling. You remember that if you have such a potential in quantum mechanics, then there are two ground states and they are split by an exponentially small amount. This is the same phenomenon for a quantum field theory in a box. So the factor that would sit here is typically the tension of the, the tension of the layer that separates the liquid phase from the vapor phase. So this would be the tension of the uh, tension of the, or they call it in statistical physics latent heat. This is related, related to latent heat or the tension of the layer which in water is like 500 uh, calories per gram or something like that. So this is the same phenomenon as that in quantum mechanics, and this leads to a small modification of the rules I told you. So the way to think about what's gapped versus what's gapless is to first we look at infinite volume, we decide how many ground states there are, and then each ground state, for each ground state separately, we can apply the rules of whether it's gapped or gapless by either trying to put the theory in that ground state at large volume, or by trying to uh, just ask if there are massless particles or massive particles in this, in this vacuum, okay? So we will encounter all these situations, uh, and I'll use this terminology throughout. Now, another complication, so this is standard terminology from statistical physics that you might have seen in courses. However, it turns out that this classification of the possible phases of quantum field theory, namely gapped versus gapless, versus the number of vacua at infinite volume, this is not yet complete. There is another option that we will encounter when we discuss Chern-Simons theories. So Chern-Simons theories do not obey these uh, rules, as we will see. They have a very subtle large volume limit, and some of these discussions do not make sense. So I'll emphasize this point when we get to discuss Chern-Simons theories. So bear in mind that this is the classical terminology, but it does not apply to some phases of quantum field theory that we will encounter later. <laughs> Are there any questions about this terminology? Yes? I don't really know how we look at this, uh, this exponential or how we know that it's gross. Okay, so let me explain. As I said, I don't mind rushing through this material. It's more important that we cover this uh, points in a more or less a systematic fashion then. So let's suppose, let us uh, suppose we have a, an infinite a theory in infinite volume and you somehow was, uh, you were somehow so smart that you managed to compute the full potential exactly. And you found two exactly degenerate vacua. For instance, it was due to symmetry breaking, or it could have been due to some accidental first order transition, okay? So let's call this vacuum one and this vacuum two. 
So fact number one that is important to remember is that if you have two ground states, these are like two possible boundary conditions for the fields. So imagine that this axis is like a field phi. So vacuum one is when field, the field phi takes expectation value phi one, and vacuum two is when the field takes expectation phi two. Now, if you are a lattice person and you work at infinite volume, you're allowed to put whatever boundary conditions for the field that you like. For example, you could decide that everywhere at infinity, the field goes to phi one. And that would be like studying the fluctuations around this vacuum. And you could then ask if this vacuum is gapped or gapless, and you could uh, go back to this discussion. But you're also allowed to do something else. You're allowed to study what happens when on one side of space, the field goes to phi one, and on the other side of space, it goes to phi two. You're allowed to put these boundary conditions on the lattice. This minimizes the energy asymptotically everywhere. But it forces the field to, to, to do some kind of extra interpolation between these two vacua, okay? So this leads to something that people call a domain wall. So a domain wall is just the minimal energy configuration that interpolates between the two vacua. So this is like the layer between vapor and liquid, if you like. There's some sort of layer. This is the layer, okay? Now this domain wall has some tension T, which is measured in units of a, a energy per unit volume. So this is measured in units of energy per unit volume on the wall. This is not volume in uh, D minus one dimensional space. This is volume in, uh, well, this is volume in D minus two dimensional space where this wall is uh, approximately located. So this is the tension of the wall. And now, when you put this theory in, in a box, uh, when you put this theory in, in a box, let's say with periodic boundary conditions, you are no longer allowed to assign different uh, asymptotic values for phi one and phi two at infinity because we're in a box. So when you perform the full pass integral over all the possible configurations, there could be configurations where there is a domain wall. So the point is that uh, when you uh, put the theory in a box, since we're not supposed to choose boundary conditions, but just sum over all the possible boundary conditions, this is analogous to this problem in quantum mechanics, that we have uh, x, this is the potential, and we sum over all the possible quantum path in quantum mechanics. So the tunneling uh, probability in quantum mechanics is analogous to the tension of this domain wall. Because the domain wall is basically the action of the, the tension of the domain wall is essentially the action of the configuration that would allow you to go from vacuum one to vacuum two. So when you put the theory in a big, big box, uh, the tunneling probability between phi one and phi two is finite. And uh, the, what replaces the action of the bounds in quantum mechanics is the tension of the domain wall. So you create domain walls and they run over all of space. And from this, you get a factor of L here. You get a factor of L, and here you get the tension of the wall. The power here is because uh, when you compute the total energy of the wall, you should also multiply by the size of this uh, dimension. So you get some powers of L and a power of the tension. Is that more or less clear or not yet? Any other questions? Yes. Is there any way to explain more detail why we have gapless electric field field C? No. Uh, so w it's gapless, as I said, gapless could arise in quantum field theory in two natural ways. One is through a conformal field theory, which is a second order phase transition. That's this business here. Another is through the spontaneous breaking of a global symmetry. Uh, there is a question, which is uh, why is there conformal symmetry every time that there is a gapless mode, which is not of this type? And this is an important question on, on which there was lots of work starting from the 80s. I'm not going to discuss that. I'm just going to assume that. This will be a separate course to try to explain. <coughs> Any other? Say again. Uh, 
Probably not. Probably not. You could imagine like a massless spin three half particle in some extension of quantum field theory. I mean, it's hard to say that this is exhaustive, but this is what we will encounter in this course. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so let's start uh, discussing some interesting examples of these ideas. So the most, the most familiar example the most familiar example is just phi to the four theory. So our Lagrangian is d phi squared. I'm going to be in Euclidean signature throughout most of this course, actually probably throughout the whole course. So I'm going to be in Euclidean signature. So we can have a mass, and we can have uh, some quartic coupling. That's an interesting uh, model of the, sometimes it's called the Landau-Ginsburg type model. Landau-Ginsburg type model. And let's just try to understand what this model does as a function of its parameter m squared, assuming that lambda is positive. So I'm gonna assume that lambda is positive. And we're gonna study the, the physics of this model as a function of the mass squared, and uh, try to put it in that, uh, try to put it in that terminology, what we find. So oftentimes, I'll draw the picture like this. So this will be the m squared axis, and m squared may be either positive or negative despite being m squared. So let's try to analyze the model in different limits and see what happens, okay? So what happens if m squared is huge and positive? If m squared is huge and positive, then we just have a very massive particle. We have a single ground state. The potential is like this. The potential is like this. We have a single massive particle single ground state, and it's obviously gapped. So there, it's gapped, one ground state, and the Z2 symmetry is unbroken. Which Z2 symmetry? There is a Z2 symmetry that takes phi to minus phi. This is a symmetry along this uh, of this model. Now, if m squared is huge and negative, uh, the potential looks like this. Why do I say huge? Uh, I keep saying huge because when m squared is not very large compared to lambda in appropriate units, there could be strong quantum fluctuations because this is an interaction term and there are Feynman diagrams. And uh, this model will be strongly coupled at the scale lambda typically where lambda is appropriately scaled to be of dimensions of energy. And so to avoid this strong coupling regime, we need to take the mass to be very large. And then when we go to, when the mass squared is gonna be small, there could be some interesting quantum effects and we'll discuss them soon. But before we discuss the quantum effects, let's, let, let, let's understand the easy weakly coupled limits when m squared is large. So when m squared is large and negative, we have two vacua, obviously. So each vacuum is gapped. So the fluctuations around each vacuum are still massive. You can try to compute. Uh, it's just the second derivative at those minima. It's non-zero. There are two ground states. And Z2 is broken. Spontaneously. Okay. Yeah. So these facts are robust facts about the full quantum theory. They are not artifacts of the classical approximation because they are correct at very large mass. And at very large mass, the classical analysis is valid since uh, all the particles are much, much heavier than the scale at which the interactions become strong. 
So these are correct facts. And then there is an intermediate regime where there are dragons, right? Where we cannot compute anything from first principles because the theory is strongly coupled. So let's try to do some dimensional analysis to try to understand what is this regime to try to understand what, what, what is that uh, region where quantum fluctuations are big, what is this region all about? So for that, we need to neglect the mask word. Yep? Yeah, that, that's what I'm going to explain now. I'll try to convince you that this uh, is a correct fact about the full Hamiltonian, even though it arose from classical analysis. So the point is that we have to try to compute the mass dimensions of the coupling lambda. And for that, we neglect this term because this is our parameter. So we neglect this term. And we know that the dimension of phi is d minus 2 over 2. That's from the kinetic term. That's the mass dimension. Is that clear? And therefore, the dimension of phi to the 4 is uh, 2 times d minus 2. And therefore, the dimension of lambda is a d minus that. So it's d minus 2 times d minus 2. So that's the same as, a, let's see, 4 minus d. OK? So what does it mean? There is a huge difference between d bigger than 4 and d smaller than 4. It's a very important critical dimension in critical phenomena. So if d is bigger than 4, because the dimension of this coupling lambda is the, it has negative energy units, it actually, uh, per, actually at, at low energies, phi to the 4 uh, dies out. So at energies, uh, at low energies, uh, phi to the 4 becomes, uh, unimportant, and since we are all, the questions that we're asking here about are about the vacuum of the theory, the vacuum structure of the theory, and vacuum are all about zero energy states or low energy states. Since the phi to the four interaction dies out at low energies, uh, this means that the model is not really interacting at low energies. So at low energies, phi to the four becomes unimportant, Quantum fluctuations, quantum fluctuations go to zero. They become trivial. And so in this case, our analysis is definitely valid both at, both at large m squared as well as at large positive m squared as well as large negative m squared. And in fact, it's valid all the way to a zero mass because at low, enough energies, the fact that the model is interacting and has quantum fluctuations makes no difference. And indeed, in this case, what it means is that the phase diagram is quite simple. We have Z2 breaking on one side, so Z2 preserving vacuum on the other side, and there is a second order phase transition. Because the classical analysis is valid, you see that when M squared is zero, there is a massless particle classically. And since quantum fluctuations are small, the classical conclusions are valid in the full quantum theory. And therefore, there is an exactly massless particle. So we have a second order phase transition. But this second order phase transition is boring because there are no quantum fluctuations. So it's just a Gaussian fixed point. This is just a Gaussian fixed point, Gaussian model. A Gaussian model is a model where all the scaling dimensions quantum mechanically are the, are the same as the classical scaling dimensions. So essentially what I'm trying to tell you in so many words is that above four dimensions, in fact it's d bigger or equal to four, is that above or equal to four dimensions, uh, the classical analysis of this model becomes exact at low energies. All the correlation functions are Gaussian and there are no interesting quantum fluctuations. Okay. For this smaller than four, the situation is much more interesting. For this smaller than four, the situation is much more subtle. 
and it actually depends on how small d is. We'll see that there is a difference between d equals one, d equals two, so it becomes very subtle. And the main, the main reason that the situation is so subtle for d smaller than four is that uh, this dimension is positive, and so quantum fluctuations completely dominate the low energy physics, if there is low energy physics. So at energies below, if the energy is below the scale that is set by this interaction parameter, you see that this now has mass dimensions, positive mass dimensions, and therefore it sets a certain scale below which the model is strongly interacting. And this scale is just uh, lambda to the appropriate power. So we need to make something of dimensions of energy, so we take lambda and put one over four minus d. Lambda to the power one over four minus d has dimensions of energy. So when the energies are below that, the model has strong uh, quantum fluctuation. And this is why taking the mass to be very large is good. If your mass is bigger than this scale, you don't have to worry about it. So if the mass is uh, much bigger than this uh, scale, then the model becomes gapped even before it became strongly interacting. Okay, so if this mass squared is much bigger than that, then the model is uh, gapped before it gets a chance to be strongly interacting, before it becomes strongly interacting. And that's why the classical analysis is always valid at large enough m squared. And this will be important for all the talks that I'm gonna give. This idea will be uh, recurring in all the talks. That for large enough mass, the quantum fluctuations haven't yet set in, so we can do classical analysis. But that also means that there are dragons here, because if the mass is small enough, the quantum fluctuations set in, and we cannot compute anything. And we have to make conjectures, or to ask our lattice friends. Okay? Yes. You're asking why is this true? Yeah. So let's look at this model for a second. So there is a scale for strong quantum fluctuations that is set by this term. If you do Feynman diagram expansion, that would lead to strong quantum fluctuations at low energies, but not at high energies. However, if this piece is huge, that means that below the, that below the scale m squared, there is nothing already. The theory is empty because there is one particle phi whose mass is m squared. And if the mass of that particle is huge, then at low energies there is anyway nothing to discuss. Because all the correlation lengths, so if you want to mathematically understand how that works, the Feynman diagram expansion coming from this term will have a certain power series that becomes, that becomes more and more important at long distances. But this leads to an exponential suppression at long distances because there is a heavy particle. So if this is much bigger than that, uh, the exponential suppression completely kills the quantum fluctuations, okay? Any other questions? Okay, so the good news is that we know what happens for large m squared analytically, but for small m squared, this model is very hard because there are strong quantum fluctuations. And in fact, uh, nobody has been able to solve this model analytically uh, below four dimensions. So what people know how to do is that they can take uh, kind of what this is called the epsilon expansion. The idea is that you see that four is like a special number in this business. I think I'm, yeah, four is a special number in this business. And uh, people have observed in the 70s that you can do an expansion in epsilon where you can control the fluctuations. And what you find in this uh, expansion scheme, I won't repeat it, this is a long story is that essentially the picture is the following. You have a Z2 breaking phase, a Z2 preserving phase, and then there is a single second order transition. So if what you find when epsilon is small and positive, this can be understood uh, analytically. This is the Wilson-Fisher expansion, epsilon expansion. So this limit can be studied analytically, 
And what you find is that between these two phases, there is a second order phase transition. But unlike d bigger than four, the quantum fluctuations are no longer exactly Gaussian. So this is a non-Gaussian model. So this is an interacting, in moderate, in moderate parlance, we would say that this is an interacting conformal field theory. So that's, that's true It's like, you know, when the number of dimensions of space is 3.99, whatever that might mean, it's a formal expansion. Now, if you go all the way to three dimensions, where this model is very interesting because it applies to uh, magnets, uh, this model is called the Ising model, and it applies to magnets. So perhaps the most interesting case is three dimensions, and then, uh, of course, you cannot trust the epsilon expansion. It's not controlled. Nobody knows that it's, nobody has been able to prove analytically that it's a second order transition that leads to an interacting CFT. But we have overwhelming numerical evidence for that, as well as a recent work on the bootstrap, which has established the existence of this CFT beyond any doubt. So we believe that this is also true in three dimensions. But this is based on uh, numerical simulations and some indirect evidence. In fact, most, but okay, so let me summarize it. You're asking why is it so hard to prove analytically? Unfortunately, to prove it analytically, what you need to do, well, if you're a stupid like me, what you would try to do is to just resum, this inter just resum all the Feynman diagrams. But you can imagine that the Feynman diagrams here are not so easy to resum. Just four, pi to the four Feynman diagrams, you need to resum them to all orders. How are you gonna do that? There is no currently existing technology to do that. Okay. Um, So in D equals three, in fact, for D bigger than one, uh, let, let me see. Um. So in this range between four and two, uh, what everybody believes, and this is supported by lattice simulations, is that there is a second order transition and it's an interacting conformal field theory. And the computation of the scaling exponents of the conformal field theory is an interesting problem and you can learn about it if you tune in to some lectures on the conformal bootstrap. The computation of the uh, scaling exponents here, this is the topic of the bootstrap uh, program. That's an alternative to the Feynman diagrams, which you just asked me about. Okay. However, this cannot be true all the way to um, D equals one, for instance, because for D equals one, you know very well what this model does. You saw this model in your quantum mechanics courses. For D equals one, does anybody have a suggestion? First of all, this whole diagram breaks down. Why? Do you know why? Because you cannot break discrete symmetries in quantum mechanics. So by, by the time you are at D equals one, there is no phase, there is no, no such thing as the tool breaking. So the ridiculous thing about quantum mechanics is that even the classical analysis at very large M squared breaks down. Because when you have two vacua in quantum mechanics, there is an instanton that leaves the degeneracy and therefore there are no two ground states. There is just one ground state. So by the time you get to D equals one, uh, this transition is, is removed. Another thing that you should know just for your general knowledge is that the D equals two is also a very special case. And at D equals two, this model has uh, scaling exponents which are known. Uh, for D equals two, this model was, uh, this model, uh, well, the interacting CFT is in fact free, and it's the theory of a free fermion. So there is a fermion that emerges out of this theory in a somewhat counterintuitive fashion. So this theory is equivalent to a free fermion. That is essentially what Onsager found uh, many years ago. 
but for the equal three, it's a hard open problem to say anything intelligent about this model. Okay, so if there are no questions, yeah? Yeah, so you could say that the, the emergence of a free fermion out of this model looks uh, bizarre because this is a bosonic model. But in, um, in the one plus one dimensions, this is allowed because there is the notion of bosonization. So it's very closely related to bosonization. Any other questions? Yeah. Any questions from the back? Okay, so let's continue our journey in this. Uh, uh, so the next interesting class of models and uh, that would lead us where I wanna get is if we put a vector here. I wanna discuss these models now. Okay, so uh, I have to replace some formulas here. What I mean by vector, when I write this equation, what I mean is phi squared squared. Okay, and phi is just an n-dimensional vector. Okay, this is another interesting class of models with lots of real life applications. For the case of n equals one is relevant for magnets. The case of n equals two is relevant to superfluid helium. The case of n equals three appears, I think, in perscovite materials, if I'm pronouncing it right. Pervoskite materials, I think they're called, and so on. And the large n limit of this model is related to high spin gravity, to Vassilius theory. These are, so this class of models is extremely interesting, and it appears both in string theory, in statistical physics, and condensed matter. And in fact, this, the case that I'm gonna focus about is n equals two, which leads to a duality. That's our first example of duality. Okay? So that's our topic now. So the Z2 symmetry is replaced by what? Can somebody in the audience say? Hmm? O n, very good. So the Z2 symmetry is replaced by an O n symmetry. Notice that O1 is Z2, so that's good. We land on our feet, which takes phi to any matrix times phi, which is an O n matrix. Any O n matrix times phi. Okay? Let's discuss these models. So I have, to, I have to fix this. I know that it's not so easy to fix pictures in the notebook, but that's why this is good that it's recorded, right? So I have to re fix this picture. So now instead of, a, instead of two ground states, we have a, a continuum of ground states. So we encounter the nambu goldstone phenomenon. So now there are gapless modes. So I fix the word gap, it's gapless. And these are Goldstone bosons that correspond to the symmetry breaking of ON to ON minus one. Why? Because if the mass squared is huge and negative, the potential wants to, mean, the potential wants to turn on some expectation value for phi. So without loss of generality, we can take the expectation value for phi in the vacuum to be some phi zero and then a bunch of zeros. What, what subgroup of ON does this vector preserve? ON minus one, okay? So there is a symmetry breaking pattern, and so there are massless Goldstone bosons. And uh, so ON is broken. Here, the analysis is the same, except that I have to fix the Z2 to say ON. Agreed? Because everything is massive and uh, gaps and strong interactions are not a big deal. Here there are again dragons, and we have to resort to conjectures or lattice simulations. And uh, the status here is that it's basically the same as, through the, as for the Ising model. We get the second order transition, there is an interacting CFT. Uh, I can remove the comment about D equals one, it's not relevant anymore. And I can remove the comment about D equals two, it's not gonna be important. So this stays the same. So there is a second order phase transition with an interacting conformal filter for any n. Yep. So in the previous picture for n is one, this part is now gap, it's called gap, right? Yes. Why is there something So the question is, why uh, why this part 
which was previously gapped, now turned into gapless, right? So the point is that previously the symmetry was Z2, and Z2 was broken to nothing. When you have discrete symmetry breaking, you do not have number Goldstone bosons. But when you have, you have continuous symmetry breaking, you have number Goldstone bosons. As a small exercise, you can try to compute the number, the number of such massless particles from the number Goldstone theorem. It's a small uh, warm-up exercise. I'll give you more serious exercises. Any other questions? Okay. Say again, I, can you repeat the question? They ask why it doesn't become a gapless view and said because uh, uh, breaking the symmetry is all the same symmetry as the boson and so on and so forth. So breaking Goldstone is also the same. But why haven't they put bosons in it if they were massless? Because the Goldstone bosons are massless. And massless particles is what we define to be a gapless model. You see, uh, here, a, there were, a gapless model could arise from either some conformal field theory like the second order phase transition point, or it could arise from spontaneous symmetry breaking. But here I was imprecise, I should have written continuous. Spontaneous, continuous symmetry breaking. If it's a discrete symmetry breaking, as we discussed, it's a different, different thing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me focus on the case which will be of most interest in these lectures. That's uh, essentially the starting point of duality. And that's the case of n equals two. For n equals one, there isn't, okay, all right. Let me start from n equals two. So I'm going, I'm going to discuss in some detail the special miracles that appear for the n equals two model. It has an extremely rich physics and everything I say has been observed experimentally in experiments with superfluids. So it's a really beautiful subject where uh, the connection between you know, mass and real life is uh, very direct. So this model appears in the literature under many, many guises and names. Condensed matter people often call it the XY model. So if you hear the word XY model, you know that you're on, you know what we're talking about. So, some people in the bootstrap community call it the O2 model because it has L2 symmetry. Some people call it the Wilson-Fisher model because, uh, because Wilson-Fisher were the first, the first people to set up this epsilon expansion. Yep. Why is it called XY model? Say again. You're asking why is it called XY? Uh, it's because of this, you know, <laughs> uh, when this vector is two-dimensional, so you might call it phi one and phi two, or you might call it X and Y. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's why it's called the XY model. Okay? Uh, the, 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 then there is the Wilson-Fisher model. And the case that we'll be mostly interested in is D equal three, where this is the theory of superfluids. Okay? The miracles that I'm gonna tell you about, they're all particular to D equals three. They were not extended to the D equal 3.1 and or 3.99, there are D equals three miracles. They do not hold in two dimensions, at least not as, uh, uh, strictly D equals three miracles. So let's start. And all the analysis that we're going to do is uh, classical. So there is absolutely no excuse for you not to understand or for me not to be able to explain something. It's all just classical physics of this model with uh, you know two components. So it's really elementary in some way. Then there will be quantum corrections. We'll discuss the quantum corrections. There will be some conjectures. But the classical part should be extremely solid and agreed by everybody. Okay. So let me just redraw the phase diagram for this model so that we have it for reference. We have a second order phase transition point, which is the, fixed, the conformal field theory point. Here there is a, uh, a gapless mode which describes the breaking of O2 to O1. So the breaking is from O2 to O1, right? But what is O1? O1 is Z2. 
And O2 is roughly speaking Z2 times a semi-direct product with SO2. So sometimes people just say that it's like SO2 broken to nothing, and it's correct. There is just a single Goldstone boson which lives on the circle. SO2 is the same as a circle. Hmm? I'm just saying that um, the O part here, so the ON group is disconnected, right? There is the disconnected rotation reflection and the, ro and the connected rotations. So from this formula, you can omit the O part. Okay? So this describes, for n equals two, a single Goldstone boson, which lives on a circle. So it's like SO2 broken to nothing, it's the same thing. Is this clear? What is this Goldstone boson? If M squared is large and negative, then phi sits at the vacuum, and the Goldstone boson is just the phase of phi. Is this clear? This is the light field, the phase of phi. So we write phi equals e to the i phi. And the value of, the absolute value of phi is fixed by minimizing this potential for negative M squared. You just minimize it, you find the absolute value of phi, and the phase is the massless particle. So phi is identified with phi going to two pi. Phi is fixed. This is not, this is gonna be just a fixed value. It's not gonna fluctuate because M squared is taken to be huge. So the, 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 the minimum of phi are fixed, but this is a massless particle. This is a massless Nambugoto particle, Nambu Goldstone particle. Nambu a Goldstone article. Are there any questions about it? To find the absolute value of phi, we just minimize the potential. So what is the Lagrangian for var phi? What is the Lagrangian for this guy? The Lagrangian for this guy is given by some coefficient, which is dimensionful. <coughs> we, it's sometimes called f squared. This is some fixed dimensionful coefficient that has to do with this value phi, it's just fixed. And then there is a kinetic term, d phi squared, and if you want, you can put a half. So this is our effective Lagrangian. But there could be some, uh, there could be some terms with uh, four derivatives, uh, suppressed by some scale, and so on. So when you go to very, very low energies, the derivatives are negligible, and you just remain with a free particle moving on a circle. Okay? Yes. But it's not just the two pi, this periodicity here is not, it's just like a trivial identification because there is no distinction between phi and phi plus two pi. The fact that this Lagrangian, for instance, does not include phi squared is because this has to do with spontaneous symmetry breaking and the symmetry that we're talking about is O2 or SO2. SO2 acts on these coordinates by rotating them. So it acts by shifting phi by a constant. So SO2 acts on phi by shifting it by an arbitrary constant, right? That's how SO2 would act. It just changes the phase. And that's why you're not allowed to write any term in the Lagrangian that violates the symmetry. Okay, so let's discuss the physics of this model. Yes? So where did the symmetry break in the case? So that means if this mass line were on the left? Exactly. We're discussing now this limit. So then, um, I don't understand. You say that F value of phi is fixed because it gains mass and you take the mass of the U. Yes, but very good. But in the high mass regime of the mass line. Oh, we are very, very far here. We're in the large negative M squared. So let's look at this potential. When M squared is huge and negative, like minus a million, the potential is gonna look like this. And this is, this is going to fix the absolute value of phi. I mean, there is a circle here. So the radius of the circle is the absolute value of phi. Is that clear? And that's completely fixed. 
this is going to be fixed by this parameter slam dyn m squared, and since m squared is huge, it's not going to fluctuate. You can compute. Let let another like warm up homework problem could be uh, compute the mass of the absolute value of phi in order to convince yourself that it's so heavy in this limit that we can completely ignore it. Okay? And the massless degree of freedom is the is the one that's like describing the phase here on the circle. Okay? So this model has a I mean this model has a massless particle and it's all clear, but it has more interesting objects. So it has more interesting objects which uh, are experimentally very uh, relevant for experiments in uh, superfluid helium. So let's uh, let me discuss those other objects. So the most interesting object that exists in this model beyond just the phi particle are what people in condensed matter call superfluid vortices. And in high energy physics, we just call them vortices. Okay, they call them superfluid vortices. We might call them axion vortices or just vortices. What are these objects? Those are not the phi particles. There's something else. They're not just excitations of phi. So those are special objects around which phi goes to phi plus two pi. So you can imagine constructing a configuration at very low energies, which consists of a point defect, a certain defect in space, which you might call a vortex. And around the defect, phi goes to phi plus two pi. So in condensed matter physics, this arises as a vortex in superfluids. But we might just try to study this defect. What is the mass of this defect? What are its interactions? Is the problem clear? Why does this defect even exist? So let's try to understand this defect a little bit this vortex. So phi lives on a circle. Phi is a variable. Phi is a, is a field. So phi is a, a function of x. And uh, there are several kinds of uh, excitations of phi. An excitation of phi is just a departure from a constant phi. Constant phi is the vacuum. Uh, that's the minimum energy configuration. So one, one interesting departure from the minimum energy configuration is the plane wave for phi. So phi will just be like a little blip. There will be a small excitation for phi in some place in space. This will be like a wave packet. So this would be like a wave packet for the number Goldstone boson. And these are the ordinary phi particles. If you quantize the theory like in Peskin and Schroeder, those will be the particles that you described. But there is another configuration that's interesting to study. And that is the configuration where there is a point in space. It's a preferred point in space around which phi has a monodromy. So phi is, lives in a circle. Phi is a map between space and a circle. So you can just take a point and decide that around that point, phi goes to phi plus two pi. So phi goes uh, all around the circle. Is that clear? Yeah? So this is like a point that we excise from space. That's the core of the vortex. People would call it the core, the core of the vortex too. So, any questions? Okay. Yes. Yes. We're in Euclidean three, three dimensions. So that, so in, when we go back to Minkowski, sorry. Yeah, this discussion makes more sense in Minkowski signature, because we want to take a slice of time, and then we have space, and we look at the configuration where phi has a vor like arrow goes around the circle around some point defect. So that's why this is a particle, because it happens at, like at every time slice. So this is a vortex. This is a particle-like object. It has a world line. So if you were to, this is your space, okay, and this is your time. So you could put this defect anywhere you want, at any time slice. So it describes like a slowly moving vortex. Is that clear? So in condensed matter, it appears like a vortex that's slowly moving. Any? Okay, so I should have said that. That's indeed 
that that picture is taking place in R2. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So we're trying to describe slowly moving external vortices. So let's try to understand their properties. So we have to try to compute the energy that is stored in this vortex. So uh, how do we do that? We just go back to this Lagrangian. So the energy functional is an integral over space of uh, this coefficient f squared with a half and then d phi squared. And there could be some corrections. Plus d phi to the four with some scale, da 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 da, yada yada yada. Okay, we have to try to compute the energy of this object. So how do we do that? We, we just go far enough from, you see? The point, of, the point about this vortex is that if you have a monodromy of phi around the vortex, it's not something that you can get rid of when you go very far from the vortex. So even very, very far from the vortex, when this distance is big, there would still be some vorticity in the field phi because it's not something that can disappear without a singularity. So we can try to compute the energy stored in this configuration far from the core of the vortex. The advantage of going far from the core of the, of the, of the vortex, vortex is that we can neglect these terms. Far from the core of the vortex, you'll see in a second, this is completely negligible, these higher dimensional terms. So we can compute the energy from just this piece. So, uh, how does d phi scale? So we just use dimensional analysis. Suppose we're a distance L away from the vortex. So this is gonna be one over L. Let's call this L, okay? Because phi is something that's measured in units of, you know, natural angles. So phi is dimensionless in this convention. Um, F squared has dimensions of mass. And since phi is dimensionless, the only Possibility for d phi is to be over the order of the distance from the vortex times uh, something of order one. Indeed, if you just expand this in radial, it's very convenient to go to polar coordinates. So this con contains a piece that looks like the distance from the vortex times the derivative of phi with respect to the angle. So this is theta. And this is, since you have vorticity one, this is just order one. And so we get one over L squared. So this is one over L, just from dimensional analysis. And therefore this is gonna be uh, D2X, one over L squared times F squared from the first piece. And then there will be something like one over L to the four, da 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 da. Now this is also of order L squared. This is an integral over all of space. So this is of order of L squared. So we see that there is a log. <laughs> The first piece gives the log of the distance. And the other pieces are completely convergent. So this is the contribution to the energy of this vortex from very long distances. We see that it's divergent logarithmically. Okay? However, if we try to, now let's ask what happens close to the vortex. We're obviously close to the vortex, we cannot say anything. Because close to the vortex, uh, the answer to what is the energy of this vortex is gonna be dominated by these higher derivative terms. And the closer you get to the core of the vortex, the more important are these higher derivative terms. And so we cannot say anything intelligent without further assumptions. So from short distances, close to the core of the vortex, we do not know. So close to the core, we don't know. But far from the core, we know that it's logarithmically, logarithmic in the distance. This is far from the core. Okay, 
Now, this has uh, far-reaching physical implications. That means that if, you're, if you have a big chunk of superfluid, can you create one vortex? Can, like say you have a dynamical system, which may or may not create vortices out of the vacuum. Can you create a vortex in a big, big chunk of superfluid? The answer is from this, obviously no. Because if your volume is infinite, it's gonna cost infinite energy to create a single vortex. Is that point clear? That's why in infinite uh, samples of superfluid, they never see vortices, or they see vortex and anti-vortex. You can create a vortex, let's say plus one, around which the monodromy goes like that, and some very far away vortex, minus one, around which the monodromy goes the other way, and so that the total energy is finite, and what is gonna be the energy of a vortex and anti-vortex in this case? It's gonna be just the logarithm of the distance between these two guys, but now it's gonna be finite. Because if you go very, very far away from this vortex and anti-vortex, there is no more vorticity in the field, the energy converges, but there is some logarithm from the distance. Logarithm of the distance. So that's why in physical systems, at infinite volume, you're always gonna create vortices and anti-vortices in pairs. And now, um, this discussion should remind you of something this logarithm and the logarithmic energy, okay? For something from a completely different field. Let's recall the Coulomb potential. What is the Coulomb potential in uh, three dimensions? How does it go? The Coulomb, uh, let's say the Coulomb force. How does the Coulomb force between two charges go in two dimensions, in three dimensions, in two plus one dimensions? Hmm? One over R, right. So how does the energy go? log of R, okay? So if you put an electric charge, if you put an electric charge at some point in space in three plus one dimensions, the total energy is the electric field squared integrated over D3x. The electric field in a three plus one dimensions goes like one over distance squared. So this is convergent in three plus one. But in two plus one, this is E squared times d squared x, and e goes like one over r, and this is therefore logarithmically divergent. So this situation with vortices is extremely reminiscent of what happens to if you put a single electric particle in the vacuum in the Coulomb phase, where there is a massless abelian gauge field. So this reminds, strikingly, it's, stri it's a striking reminiscence, it's a striking uh, analogy, I should say, a uh, striking analogy with uh, uh, charges, striking analogy with charges in two plus one for a billion gauge fields for Maxwell for Maxwell field. And this fact that you need vortices and anti-vortices to have a finite energy configuration, that's nothing but the Gauss law, right? So we see an analogy also with the Gauss law. That Gauss law states that the only finite energy configurations in finite volume have total zero charge. So that's uh, very reminiscent of what we found here. Okay. Let's, let me show you that there is a further analogy. You can make the analogy even more striking by doing a, an additional thing, an additional little computation. Let me make the analogy even more striking. Let's do a more striking analogy, okay? The more striking analogy uh, is achieved in the following way. So far we've discussed the system which has O2 symmetry. It's just a complex scalar field in three dimensions, okay? One interesting thing we may try to do is to break 
very, very slightly uh, the symmetry which leads to shifts of phi. So let's break SL2 very slightly. So break slightly in the Lagrangian. So our Lagrangian is now, now going to be d phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus lambda phi to the 4. But now I'm going to add another term with a tiny coefficient epsilon, which is going to break the O2 symmetry. So in terms of the components um, phi 1 and phi 2, let's just add phi 1. with a tiny, tiny coefficient. So since this coefficient is tiny, it does not really destroy the effective field theory completely. We still have a very, very light number Goldstone particle. Now in the literature, this would be called the pseudo number Goldstone particle because it's just ever so slightly massive due to this uh, symmetry breaking term. So this is called a pseudo number Goldstone particle. So the number Goldstone, okay? So what, does anybody have a guess for what this would lead to in the effective Lagrangian? I need to fix the effective Lagrangian for, for, the, for the angle now, just a little bit. So what do I need to add now to fix this Lagrangian? Hmm? A math term, but there is a point here. Suppose I just added phi squared. It's a good idea. But phi squared is not consistent with phi going to phi plus 2 pi. Phi plus phi plus 2 pi, you see, I, I, I was able to break the SO2 symmetry, which leads to shifts of phi by an arbitrary constant. But shifting phi by 2 pi is not something you can break. Because shifting phi by 2 pi is a so-called a gauge symmetry. You cannot break it. It's just a stupid identification in field space. So phi squared is not quite right. What's the best next thing? What looks like phi squared for small phi, but is periodic? Cosine. Indeed, phi 1 is just the cosine of phi, right? It's like the x-coordinate. So x equals uh, cosine. So we have cosine of phi. Now I want to make sure that I add this with a sign such, I could choose the sign here, such that the vacuum, now, now when you have a cosine, we have a circle, right? We have a circle on which phi lives. I want the vacuum to be at phi equals zero, just for convenience. So therefore, I need to flip the sign here oh. in Euclidean signature and, and put an epsilon. Yeah. Say again? Sine versus cosine is the just the change what you call phi one versus phi two. But cosine two phi could be a completely different story. Because if you have cosine of two phi, there would be two minima on the circle. That would correspond to adding, let's say, phi 1 squared. But if I just add phi 1, then I just get the cosine. <coughs> so we have a new term, minus epsilon cosine phi. So now not all the points on the circle are deemed equivalent, because there is this preferred point where minus cosine phi is minimized, which is phi equals 0. OK, so now there is a true, unique, gapped vacuum and the phase diagram of the model with this interaction does not have the symmetry breaking phase anymore that we had at large negative mass squared. At large negative mass squared, we now have a true, unique, gapped vacuum. There is no more symmetry breaking now because we destroyed the symmetry. But let's see what it does to our, uh, in, to our vortex. So we have again, oh, sorry, I just erased. We have this vortex. So previously, the energy was minimized by having a nice uniform vortex field which surrounds, which surrounds this uh, defect. But now that we've added this cosine interaction, this uh, vortex field is not going to be uniform anymore. The question is, at, long enough, at large enough distances from the vortex core, what is, gonna the, what is the configuration going to look like? How can you make the field uh, do a monodromy while still respecting the fact that it costs some energy for phi to reside away from zero? It's a question to the audience. Does anybody have an idea 
how does the vortex gonna look like? And the hint is that it's not gonna be very uniform anymore. Does anybody have an idea how the vortex is gonna look like? Okay. So the point is that previously the field, the vortex was kind of uniform, but now there is gonna be something that emanates from the vortex, which is thin. It's like a branch cut. So the vortex core is gonna be like a branch point, and something that emanates from the vortex is gonna be like a branch cut. So phi is gonna be almost zero everywhere. But near this special point, this special line, sorry, not point, this special line, phi is going to rapidly jump. At least far away, that's a correct description of the vortex. Why does phi want to rapidly jump? Because it costs a lot of energy to change phi from being zero near the core, from phi being zero away from, away from this line. It would cost a lot of energy that scales like volume. But if we make this jump localized across the line, then the energy cost is finite. This is your homework exercise for today. This is the hard, uh, the, the non-trivial homework exercise. Uh, let me define the homework exercise. It's just an exercise about this Lagrangian. You don't need the higher order terms because as we've argued from dimensional analysis, they die off far from the core. So your exercise is to construct Go far away from the core, forget about this branch point, and just construct this solution. Show that it exists. Construct the branch cut solution. Construct the branch cut solution, estimate its tension. The tension is like the energy of this little jump over distance over like a unit of distance across this branch cut. Estimate the tension. Estimate the width. So you can ask what is the width of this thing? Please estimate the tension, the tension and the width of this configuration. It's an exercise in classical PDs. It's just a classical field theory which admits such a branch cut solution. You have to just find the right differential equation. And the point of this branch cut is that phi goes from zero so essentially phi goes to, to pi. That's the hint. That across this branch cut, phi goes to zero from two pi, but two pi is the same as zero. So away from this branch cut, the phi is always at the true vacuum, but through the branch cut, it rapidly jumps. Okay? So that's what happens once you add this symmetry breaking piece. Does this picture remind you of anything that you've seen in QCD or in young mills theory? A what? Monopoles, very good. Monopoles, or it may remind you also of quarks. Quarks sit at the end of flux tubes, right? In QCD, there is a quark, and you have an anti-quark, and they're separated by a flux tube. You've seen this picture before? And in two plus one dimensions, if you have electric charges, they can be confined and separated by a flux tube. So there is a fantastic analogy between just the physics of the O2 model, classical physics of the O2 model, and non-perturbative phenomena in gauge theory. We have seen two facts, just a second, we have seen two facts. One is that they admit confining strings. So this is analogous to the confining string. And previously we've seen uh, the flux tube, the confining flux tube. And previously we've seen that without the symmetry breaking term, we got a logarithmic divergence, like in the Coulomb phase of young mills theory. So we see uh, that the, this parameter corresponds to going from the Coulomb phase to the confining phase. So let me just write it and then I'll get to your question. I just want to stress the analogy here. So there is a striking analogy with the charge in two plus one for Maxwell, not confining. This is Coulomb phase, Coulomb or Maxwell phase. But once, this is for epsilon equals zero. For epsilon equals zero, we see a striking analogy to just a free U1 gauge field with a Coulomb phase. But for epsilon not equal to zero, we see a striking analogy to confining flux tubes. Or like the gentleman said, 
confinement of monopoles in the, uh, in the superconductors, or you can say confining of monopoles in superconductors. Or Abrikosov tubes. They're called sometimes Abrikosov tubes. So you see that this model, like magically, contains a lot of gauge theory like physics. And so this is uh, the hint for a duality that I'm going to now explain. Yeah, now to your question. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this model uh, describes in some situations superfluids, and then this is called the superfluid vortex, and this, uh, and, uh, this would be some kind of string that is attached to it. Or in this, in the, this model, as I will argue, describes also gauge theory, which is the analogy that I'm trying to build. And then this describes an electric charge, and this is the confining string, or a Wilson line, so depending on the field from which you're coming, you could uh, describe these same objects with different words. Yeah, so similarly here. Right, this, Dirac, this string here describes a physical flux tube. It's not a Dirac string. A Dirac, a Dirac string is a fictitious object that is not visible. This is, however, a physical flux tube, like the one that you know appears in superconductors, or the one that you know that appears in gauge theories. So this string is not transparent. Hmm? This is exactly like an Abrikosov string. So it's a physical object with finite tension, and it's not transparent. The Dirac string has no tension. It's just an artifact of an inconveniently done calculation. Okay, any other question? Okay, so now I want to um, uh, push this analogy for, forward to the statement of a duality. So that's the, so I'm gonna basically say that this model is the same as a gauge theory. Uh, now we have to say which gauge theory and show the map that the, that the two models indeed describe the same physics. So let's now discuss some the simplest gauge theory in 2 plus 1 dimension and show that they have the same physics. And then we'll claim that they're exactly the same, in fact. So I'll erase that. So is the homework exercise clear? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean by the tension? The tension. So this object um, has some uh, energy density. So the energy density is uh, finite per unit length. So you have a unit length here. So the tension is defined to be the energy stored in this string per unit length. Yeah. So you gotta, so what I want you to see is that you understand how to compute this. You're not gonna be able to compute it analytically. You'd have to solve some horrible PD to do that. But you, you'd be able to estimate how it scales with uh, the parameters. Namely, how does it scale with F and how does it scale with epsilon? And you would be able to do the same for the width. You would be able to determine how it scales with F and epsilon. Okay? But more importantly, you have to try to construct this configuration. Not analytically, but try to convince yourself that it exists. When I say construct, I don't mean to solve the PD. You won't be able to solve it. But just understand what to put on the computer if you ever need to estimate, you know, to do it. Yeah. Which problem to put in the computer? Okay, so now let's switch gears to discuss a gauge theory in two plus one dimensions, and then we'll make an identification between these two models. So we'll just discuss a, a first Maxwell. First I'll discuss Maxwell theory, and then I'll describe what happens when you couple it to charges. So first we'll have no charges, just pure, uh, just a photon. So the Lagrangian is one over two gauge coupling squared times F mu squared. 
where f mu is d mu b nu minus d nu b mu and b mu is a u1 gauge field okay i'll just make a few comments about it i have uh, like 10 minutes right so i'll just finish making a few comments about it and the next time we'll state the duality so <coughs> you, under, you you probably know everything that needs to be known about it in three plus one dimensions there are two polarizations here in two in three plus one dimensions there are two polarizations in two plus one there is one polarization or one degree of freedom which moves at the speed of light uh, and has spin uh, has spin one okay so there is one one degree of freedom in two plus one dimensions but the truly uh, different aspect from three plus one dimensions is that this theory has a global symmetry. So Maxwell theory in three plus one dimensions does not have any global ordinary, ordinary global symmetries, but this model does. So this model has a global symmetry with the following conserved current. And this current is conserved by the virtue of the Bianchi identity. So this is conserved because of Bianchi identity. And uh, in the literature, this leads to a U1 symmetry, which is called either U1 magnetic or U1 topological. These are the two names uh, that come, that, that people use to refer to this U1 symmetry. And so, when we discuss the local operators in this theory, there are local operators that carry this charge. So what are the local operators in Maxwell two plus one dimensions? So there are local operators like F, F squared, right? There is a bunch of local operators like this, but it's easy to check. They do not carry any charge under the magnetic symmetry. So this is a thing that you can check easily by writing the canonical commutation relations, check that all those guys do not, or just commute, commute with the charge, the nutter charge associated to this symmetry. So they commute with an integral over two dimensional space of J zero. So any power of F commutes. So that means that these operators are uncharged under this symmetry. It's a small homework exercise. Just by writing the canonical commutation relations, it follows immediately. So you can check that all these local operators commute with this charge, and therefore they do not carry any interesting charge. So since there is a U1 symmetry, we have to ask what are the local operators that do carry this charge? So it turns out so the theory admits, the theory admits somewhat more exotic operators, which cannot be written using the field strength of the gauge field. So these are more exotic operators because you cannot write them using the field strength. It's hard to write them explicitly, but they nevertheless exist. So they are called monopole operators. So they're called monopole operators. And they are defined such that the commutator of Q with Mn is N times Mn. So the monopole operator Mn carries charge N under uh, the U1 symmetry. But these monopole operators, while they're truly, you know, um, bona fide kosher local operators, they cannot be written using the degrees of freedom of the underlying gauge theory. Instead, they are defined in the following way. So how do we define them? They are defined in an abstract fashion. This monopole operator will be crucial for the next couple of lectures, so I want to say uh, it precisely. These uh, monopole operators are defined by uh, a more indirect approach, which is that suppose you want to define 
a, suppose you want to compute correlation functions of m1, x1, m, n, uh, sorry, m1, xn. So I have to give you a prescription for how to compute these correlation functions of local operators in Maxwell's theory. Okay? Uh, sorry, uh, since they're charged under the U1, this would vanish. So maybe I put M1 and then anything. Anything, okay? Sorry. You just have to arrange for something that wouldn't vanish. So the way you define this correlation function is that you have to go back to the pass integral over the B or over the gauge field, okay? One over two G squared, and this is an integral. So this is the pass integral of free Maxwell, which you can gauge fix. Uh, this is defined by saying that at point X, so this is defined by saying that we integrate over those gauge fields, which at point X, so around point X we take a small sphere, we take a small sphere around point X, and we say that the flux of the magnetic field through that small sphere is equal to one. That's how we define M1. So the integral of F over the small sphere over two pi is just one. That's how M1 is defined. So instead of doing a pass integral over all the possible gauge fields which are regular and smooth, we take a point from space, we say that the gauge field flux around that point is one, and then we compute the pass integral. So these monopole operators are now defined by a formula that involves the elementary gauge field. They are defined by a boundary condition in the pass integral. Now some of you may have studied Liouville theory or other two-dimensional conformal field theories, and there this idea is very commonplace. Twist operators in, let's say, the C equals one model are defined by a similar procedure. In Liouville field theory, exponentials of the Liouville field are defined by some singularity of the field. So this is the same. It's a defect operator. It's a, the hard thing is to show that this defines a true local uh, you know, gauge invariant uh, bona fide operator that obeys all the axioms of quantum field theory. But uh, uh, this, this can be shown. So the monopole operators are defined by boundary conditions on the pass integral rather than by formulas that are made out of the gauge field. And the cute thing about it is that there are the operators that carry charge under the magnetic or topological U1 symmetry. Okay? So a, a, an easy exercise is to compute the two-point function of the monopole operators. If you have extra time on your hands, just compute this. M minus one Y. It's really easy. It would not take you more than an hour. You just have to uh, just do this insertion. It can be done. Uh, it's not hard. And then from this, you would see that it looks like a local operator. You would see that it looks like a normal Green's function. You've seen such things before. Okay. So what is the utility of these operators? So the main point about Maxwell's theory in our terminology, I have two more minutes. I'll just say one more thing and then we finish. So the main utility of this theory is that it's gapless in our terminology. And now there is a small miracle, another miracle that's particular to two plus one dimensions does not occur in any other dimension which is that since there is one degree of freedom, which is moving at the speed of light, you can think about it as a lambda goldstone boson for U1 magnetic. So the photon in two plus one dimensions is an ordinary lambda goldstone boson. But for what symmetry? The magnetic symmetry. So the vacuum of Maxwell theory breaks U1 magnetic spontaneously. The U1 magnetic symmetry is broken spontaneously, and the photon is the number Goldstone boson. So what is the Lagrangian? So in fact, Maxwell theory is equivalent to this model that we just discussed at great, in great de detail. But now this is the Goldstone boson for the magnetic symmetry rather than for the SO2 symmetry. 
that we had in the, mag in the, in the O2 model. So how do you show that the magnetic symmetry is spontaneously broken? And why is the photon the massless particle? The easiest way to show this is to uh, study the two-point function. Uh, well, the easiest way to show that is to study the two-point function that I just told you. If you study this two-point function, you would see that uh, it looks like a propagation of a massless scalar particle, phi. It would be like one over x minus one squared. So you could identify uh, M with an operator that creates a number Goldstone particle from the vacuum. <clears throat> Another way, okay, so, so the main thing to remember is that Maxwell's theory in two plus one dimensions has one massless degree of freedom. Therefore, it's basically the same as a number Goldstone particle. And it's a number Goldstone particle for the magnetic symmetry. And the order parameter is the monopole operator. So the monopole operator has a non-zero expectation value in the vacuum. It's an order parameter for symmetry breaking. You could say that there is monopole condensation in free U1 gauge theory in two, two plus one dimensions. There's like monopole condensation. So next time we'll start, I'll review this idea. Maybe I'll say it in a little bit more detail. And then we'll, disc we'll discuss what happens if you add to the Lagrangian monopole operators. So you could complicate this Lagrangian in many ways. And one way in which you could complicate it is by adding monopole operators. So we'll discuss the physics of free Maxwell, of Maxwell's theory, but with monopole operators in the Lagrangian. So, and then we'll state the duality. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you add, since I, as I said, the monopole operators, they carry this U1 symmetry. So next time what I'll do is I'll review these ideas about free Maxwell again, and we'll add this operator to the Lagrangian, and thereby breaking the symmetry explicitly. I'll argue, so free Maxwell should be viewed as in being in the Coulomb phase, in the sense that if you put a probe Particles. Suppose I had, I had like infinite mass pro particles, then the electric field would spread like in like normally. Electric field would be one over R. But I'll argue that when we put a monopole operator into the Lagrangian, the theory goes from being in the Coulomb phase to being in the confining, confining phase, and the electric field would not spread like one over R. It would be uh, confined in a flux tube, and the analogy with the O2 model would become like too striking to ignore. So we'll have to do something about it. Exactly, exactly. You're anticipating everything that I want to say next time. We'll see that the photon gains a mass, you go to the confined phase, and it looks strikingly similar to the epsilon bigger than zero model of O2. So you'll see that the analogy is just too good to be an accident. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, before the coffee, so you there's an exercise session where you're going to do the exercises, um, or at least try. And um, before that, there's a coffee break, and before that, we're going to take the picture. So if everybody can just go down to this area here. We'll take the picture quickly, and then you can have your coffee break. <laughs>